What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So, we're gonna check out heels in the 2000s were built different. This is very, very true. Heels back in the 2000s, man, they were getting away with some uh, <laughs> very dastardly things, man. They were the true definition of heels and rogueness. Now, granted, uh, there are some good heels in today's wrestling, but back then you could say a lot more on television, do a lot more on television and push the envelope. So they were able to get away with damn near murder on a week to week basis, but it made for some compelling, interesting television, man. And it made you hate them. And that's the purpose of a good heel to say something borderline, super offensive or do something borderline, super offensive and to get you to hate them so we're gonna go down memory lane shout out to wrestling premiere this is uh the video we're gonna be checking out from his uh channel i'm gonna link down original video down below so make sure you guys go support him man but this should be a good one i'm looking forward to it man let's get right into this man 2000 to 2006 triple h's reputation as the uh, game had already go back triple to h 2000 to 2006 Triple H's reputation as the game had already made him one of the most <clears throat> notorious characters in WWE or WWF history. What made Triple H such a good heel was his attention to detail. Yes, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, some people were fed up with his constant title reigns, but as a character, yeah. very few had the heel character down as well as the game. It was almost unfair. He already did a great job. <laughs> Being the perpetrator of Austin getting run over and finding yep. clever ways to steal the title, but 2000's Triple H had more in him. And this had to do with his positioning on the card. He was essentially the number one guy in WWE at some points, and Triple H had a cool element to him. Not to sledgehammer. It become more apparent after the Reign of Terror era, but Triple H is one of the main reasons I made this video. This man was absolutely diabolical, plotted a return with his friend before stabbing him in the back, yep. and also become his good buddy after he was attacked in the parking lot. He showed emotion and worry over his friend, but that quickly changed when he was... Bro, he was was dog just imagine we don't know what happened to hbk he just returns he's bloodied up in the parking lot and he's over here giving a grade eight academy award performance get some help out here get some help only to find out that he was the motherfucker that did it all along oh you evil son of a bitch <laughs> Revealed to be the perpetrator. Triple H already established himself as a heel, but they went the extra mile to make him even more detestable. Then he mm -hmm. loses his match with HBK and takes yep. him out with a sledgehammer. Yep. He's all bloodied up and zero lessons learned. Okay, he hates HBK. Surely he doesn't continue this, right? Nope. nope. <laughs> this man played with a dead body at the funeral home. Yep. It's strange saying it, let alone thinking of how WWE came up with this. Like, I'm kind of confused as to how did they come to terms that this is the story. It just sounds bizarre. I don't know, but Triple H continued. He turned racist for a month against the yep. he asking him for a to ride him in his limousine as a chauffeur and it's almost a strange turn that his heel character took because the game wasn't known to be much of a racist beforehand yeah and afterwards <laughs> with evolution by his side triple h's behavior continued to develop he put a bounty on goldberg's head which mm -hmm. resulted in attempted murder many attacks and of course his anchor <laughs> beat. i forgot he did put a bounty on this nigga bro <laughs> he was a fucking menace and no one could stop him he just was doing whatever he wanted to on Monday Night Raw. Just detestable, bro. <laughs> Shattered by Batista. He oh, gave my God. different death to the other heels in the sense of, hey, I'm not going to try killing him myself. I have money for that. Other heels would do it themselves. So he was shown to have a much more calculated view of how to reach his goals. Eugene was hated by most of the heels on the roster. They didn't like him, didn't want anything to do with him, even Evolution. But Triple H found a way to use him, and it was all about the coveted World Heavyweight mm -hmm. Championship. Since Eugene was a big fan of Triple H, even stunning The Rock in this revelation, the game became his friend. It's for ulterior motives, of course, mm -hmm. but the 2004 Triple H was more selfish than Prime Kobe Bryant on the court. The amount of effort put into this charade was ridiculous. He could have won the title himself. Jumping in fun houses, making Eugene <laughs> an honorary member of Evolution, and when this month-long plan didn't come together, he obliterated yep. him and left him a bloody heap. One of the worst beatdowns Triple H put somebody through, and that's saying something. The game took out William Regal in his hotel room and had this huge sense of pride after committing these actions. Like, that image of Triple H standing in front of the mirror. <laughs> He's a fucking psycho. <laughs> Look at this. Look at that face. Blood all on it, just smirking in the... Anytime you smirk or laugh at yourself in the mirror, you're not all there. It's, there's something going on up there. <laughs> 
with a smile on his face is the perfect image to his heel run. A man who lacked morals, oh my God. integrity, loyalty, and remorse. And this wasn't even the end of it. After Randy Orton did the one thing that Triple H couldn't, mm -hmm. and that's beat Chris Benoit to become the World Heavyweight Champion, he took him out of the group, beat him senseless, and left him a bloody mess. Even then, he had expectations of Orton surrendering the belt and taking back his place as a member of Evolution, only for Orton to spit, spit in, his in his face, face. and lose the belt afterwards. The game continued on as a regular heel. He finally did something huge by manipulating Batista into thinking JBL was out to get him, mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. was a tactic to avoid the animal choosing his world title mm -hmm. for a match at WrestleMania. It didn't work though. He lost the title. So Triple H resorted to making Batista think there was friction between himself and Ric Flair. So Batista could associate himself with the Nature Boy again. But this was an elaborate setup to annihilate Batista and challenge him to a Hell in a Cell match. Mm -hmm. He lost and disappeared for a bit. Upon his return the very first night, he almost killed Ric Flair out of pity. Triple H destroyed him with a sledgehammer, opened up his already fragile forehead, and threw him into the limo, all because he felt sad over what Flair had turned into. This version of Triple H was much more wiser. The other version had evolution. I feel bad for what you've become, so I'm gonna try to murder you. <laughs> Wait, what? and often felt vulnerable without them despite his ability to great story line. from here he was a casual heel he did some stuff but it doesn't stand out most importantly triple h was much more cooler here he stopped wearing the suits often leaned towards the sunglasses and jeans and because he was less often in the main event scene fans started cheering him and after wrestlemania 22 plans were in place for a dx return now as a kid my memories of triple h as a heel are towards his late heel run i didn't like him for basic reasons but there was a coolness about him that very few had on raw at the time there was other heels i hated more Kane's already been the most diabolical wrestler that WWE had seen, but he mm -hmm. lost his touch not to mention had been a face for about two years. His masked run had run its course mm -hmm. in management's eyes and there was only one way to go, unmasking him. Mm -hmm. And this resulted in Kane being his most dominant and most dangerous. And we've just checked out a video of how diabolical Kane was, so yeah man, if... Ah, he was doing he was doing the devil's work for sure around this time. Since 1998, I'd say. It really gives off shades of his run towards WrestleMania 14 in the sense of you didn't know what he would do on a weekly basis. And that's a very hard thing to do because number one, the fans have to be interested in the talent. And two, they have to have a certain legitness about them. Kane, within his first month, tried to burn RVD, burn yep. JR, tombstone Linda McMahon, yep. toke slammed Eric Bischoff yep. off the stage. This guy was going all out and felt like a movie villain with the way they were booking him. Then proceeds to electrocute Shane's balls because, uh, I don't, I don't know. He could have thrown him into the fire returning the favor, but it was bizarre. This dude was very back and forth with this, but right afterwards, he buried his own brother alive mm -hmm. because he became one of the people. So he lost his edge. Kane's activities were mostly toned down until there was that story with Lita where he stalked her and she ended yeah. up pregnant. Yeah. Yeah. Like and ironically, this story was used as a catalyst to turn Kane face. WWE smoking on the finest crack with this one. <laughs> How do you turn a vapist into a good guy in three months? But yeah, Kane's <laughs> heel run was like a bright star that quickly runs out. He reverted to being a face again from here right up until 2008. His heel run here wasn't much other than, of course, him stalking Rey Mysterio and Kelly Kelly. He did kidnap Ranjan Singh, but this was nothing compared to 2003-04 Kane. Kurt Angle's wrestling mm. ability had made him into a legend of the game already four years into his WWE run. We don't say that often. Once Angle reverted to being a heel in early 2004, his motives were deceiving as Angle had proclaimed himself to be an American hero and a role model for the kids to strive for. His actions contradicted every mm -hmm. single claim he made. Why? First of all, Angle took up the role of SmackDown General Manager. His role is to be unbiased and provide opportunities, but instead, he turned the show upside down, made Eddie Guerrero's life a living hell, yep. screwed John Cena out of the United States Championship yep. over an accident, and of course, his deep hatred for him. Angle was a fraud that posed as a noble man, and to top it all off, he cost Eddie Guerrero the title and in turn, exposed himself as healthy. But this was nothing. Angle from here on made demons look like angels. <laughs> Big Show with the tranquilizer dart yep. shaved his head. Threatened Joy and eventually used her to get under Big Show's skin. And of course decimated Shawn Michaels just to challenge him to a match at WrestleMania 21. And the victory at the show should have mellowed him out. But no, this man turned into a mm -mm. predator to fulfill his fantasies. And straight up said he wanted to have bestiality <laughs> sex with Booker. Is that still one of the wildest things you could say to a man involving his wife? I want to have bestiality sex with your wife, bro. He got to go, if you know what I mean. There, there, there's, that's it. It's not about the wrestling. It's not about the championships. It's not about none of that. You got to. What? This man lost a plot long ago, but it was a weird time. It was a weird time for Kurt Angle, and this was all done just so the fans couldn't cheer him. Because somebody with Kurt Angle's abilities, heel or face, is gonna be loved. He goes to Raw, curses out the troops, and in an effort to show that he could get cheered, said he's not a fan of 
the black people. That's literally yeah. how he said it. Yeah. It was crazy what they were doing with him because if they let go just a little, he was going to get cheered. But yeah, Kurt Angle is one of the most <laughs> insane heels from this era of WWE. And that's saying something. This guy was a predator. He was a detestable human <laughs> being. Everything. And they did all of this just to get him booed. It was so tough for Kurt Angle. Bradshaw's career trajectory is a very strange one. A singles mm-hmm. wrestler doing nothing ends up being paired with Ron Simmons to become one of the most entertaining tag teams of the Attitude Era. His time runs out and it seems like he's heading towards retirement. But a huge opportunity opens with the departure yep. of Brock Lesnar and the injuries to the likes of The Big Show and Kurt Angle. Enter JBL. JBL was an extension of Bradshaw's real life. He was an investor, a successful one at that, and WWE constructed a new character for him relating to that. John Bradshaw Layfield was his new name. A successful mm-hmm. businessman who left Texas for New York City and in turn became the very thing that his old character, the APA, would despise. A suit wearing eagle yep. maniac who loved hearing the sound of his voice. And compared to other heels, JBL wasn't as diabolical or flat out evil. He was more grounded and his immoral actions had this cleanness to them compared to the likes of Triple H and Kurt Angle. It was a standout character trait and showed that even his actions in the squared circle were white collar. Yes, he yeah. attacked his opponents, but he never usually left them bloody. He went to the US-Mexico border and went after some immigrants <laughs> hopping the border it's almost a crazy segment now you want to see this on national tv <laughs> this is so wild bro <laughs> his heel turn it it in a sense it worked because it was grounded in some type of realism like he like he said he wasn't out here per se trying to murder people he was just more out here saying how some people of his uh demographic felt <laughs> about just the state of the world in general he would kind of bring that into the wrestling world it worked though he was saying some detestable and doing some detestable things but it wasn't too crazy like triple h or kane trying to mutilate somebody if that makes any sense but wwe 2004 was wild the undertaker was a tough opponent so he enlisted the help of gangrel and Vistra, and his cabinet cleaned up any problems that came his way the real standouts to JBL as a heel were his promos. He had this unusual contempt for the crowd and guys like John Cena and Rey Mysterio that you almost believe it's real. This man didn't have a single t-shirt. Now, I don't think anyone would have bought a JBL shirt anyways, no. but it goes to show that he was dedicated to simply being hated. No flesh of stuff. Hey, he's pretty cool. Just business and pure hatred. I yeah. hated JBL. This man was so unlikable. It would always pop up when you least expect. Mm-hmm. He had a big problem with the country of Mexico, and that would show in his feuds <laughs> with Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio. This man told Ray straight to his face, you're not a dog, you're a Mexican. Brought out Kane on May 19th of all days to face Rey Mysterio, and once he quit, he went to commentary where he'd endlessly bully other wrestlers. Yeah. Upon his return to the squared circle, he was still the same guy. Forced Shawn Michaels to become his assistant and made his life a living hell before retiring. JBL was committed to the job. He had an old school vibe to him in the sense of do whatever it takes to be hated. And he went the extra mile every yeah. single time because that was his job. Nobody ever said JBL was cool. Yeah, he was cool in 2001. But as his cowboy hat suit wearing almost politician figure, yeah. nobody said that. Edge's injury in 2003 changed the trajectory of his career entirely. Without that injury, a lot would be different. Not only in Edge's career, but the entire complexion of WWE. He came back significantly different and didn't have much support from the crowd. He lacked mm-hmm. that fire again in 2002, not to mention it was much slower in ring. So something had to give. And right when he turned heel, there was the whole lead on Matt Hardy situation. Yep. He gave him a lot of heat and hatred from the fans. And in turn... He used this fire to build momentum yep. and become the rated, rated R, R superstar. superstar. As the rated R superstar, Edge saw no boundary he'd pass if it would give him the WWE Championship. He didn't care what others thought. Yep. Later, he'd hand to anybody if they could help him as a mere tag team partner. Snitsky, Big Show, even Vince. It was crazy. And what's even crazier is that this was the early parts to rated R Edge. This character would develop more and turn into the most intelligent wrestler in the entire WWE. Edge was banging lead in the middle of the ring, destroying <laughs> his opponents with a concerto. There was this pinfall, sliding yeah. down Cena dead in his own house, and he bent and the rules like no other person in this video. Mm-hmm. DQs to save the title. Brass Knuckles even claimed that he didn't want to wrestle in Arizona because they were the last state to recognize Martin Luther King Day. This man was world class. <laughs> ex- man. man, Edge. Hall of Fame career for sure in WWE, man. He was... <laughs> he was despicable, but it just worked, bro. He was a... Just... A piece of trash human being, but it worked. It worked so well. This is fantastic. (laughs) Excuses. He convinced Mr. Kennedy to put his money in a bank briefcase on the line. Not knowing what's to come, which was a cheap shot, a cheap attack, and he's the holder of the briefcase. Makes good on the opportunity to become the champion on SmackDown. Edge found a lot of comfort as the champion on SmackDown as he managed to get with Vicky Guerrero Uh and even married her. All for his own interest. 
This guy would pull out some bizarre thing and always end up on top. He returns and gets a title shot during a title match and it works in his favor. Why? Because he's Edge, the ultimate opportunist. My most hated heel. This man ruined John Cena's life, cashed yep. in on The Undertaker, and continuously screwed Batista out of the title. And once <laughs> he saw this Vicky Guerrero thing growing thin, he divorced her and said he never liked her. Ironically, this was the most cheered he had been in about five years. There's very few that matched Edge as a heel. He was probably the coolest out of all these guys because of his style and vibe, which should work against him, of course. But mm -hmm. he made it work because he had plenty of inspiration from the likes of Roddy Piper, the Matt Hardy incident, and a booking. He was always a coward that relied on unethical means to win the title. Hell, this man found two lookalikes to yep. help him distract The Undertaker and Batista just to win the title. This guy was reaching towards the stars just to find any single way to win that title. It was crazy. Randy Orton had the perfect baseline mm. for him. He was a second generation wrestler who felt entitled due to his father's success and of course his inclusion in the Evolution faction. Orton had the heel look down. A young talent who thought the world was his and Orton did plenty. He disrespected legends such yep. as Mick Foley, Harley Race, and even RKO the Fabulous Moolah. He had a hidden type of craziness that would unravel as the years would go <laughs> oh by. Oh boy, until he reverted into did his craziness unravel. He became psychotic. Once he cut that hair, good God. <laughs> 2005 that things would change. For one, he RKO'd Stacey Keebler in order to focus on his match with The Undertaker at WrestleMania, and his feud with the dead man forced him to reveal his true nature. That of a pure psychopath. Yeah. He burned a casket with the dead man in it, and upon his return, proceeded to drive a lowrider in reverse and cause an explosion. That didn't work, and after the humbling inside Hell in a Cell, Orin moved on to business like nothing happened. He tried to smear Eddie Guerrero's legacy saying he's in hell, mm -hmm. rode his lowrider, and screwed Ray out of his title shot at WrestleMania. But all this was nothing compared to the next couple of years. Ray and RKO as a tag team had some diabolical moments. They basically yeah. killed Ric Flair here and took him out with a contender. I remember watching that, bro. I remember watching them murder Ric Flair, bro. I was like, oh, this is, this is, oh, business is picked up. That DX arc rated RKO feud. Oh my god, that was so good. He they murdered this nigga Ric Flair, bro. This was oh business has picked picked up, as JR would say, man. They were ruthless. Erto did it to DX, but once they went their separate ways, Randy Orton became even more cold and calculating. He brought out the punt, used yep. it to take out plenty of wrestlers, even John Cena's dad. Yeah. And Orton needed this edge to finally get his hands on the WWE Championship, but keeping it required him to be persistent with this newfound attitude, and he learned the hard way. So upon his return from injury, a big emphasis was made on Orton's unstable side. He punted yeah. Mr. McMahon after yep. having an argument with Stephanie, and from there, unhinged Randy Orton was here. He always mm -hmm. showed remorse over his actions initially, but that would change. He did things with intent, such as DDTing <laughs> Stephanie and kissing her in front of Triple oh H, God. taking him and Batista out with the punt, and then of course he had the bald look, which fit him well. He was having problems mentally, hearing Yeah, voice. bro. Once that hair went away fully, he was... This is maximum savage Randy right in here. A hundred percent savagery. No hair, just here to kick people's skulls off they off their bodies, bro. It's crazy. He says I need to lash out on the likes of John Cena. This man was tortured and insane. Attempted murder with a power. Yep. Hell, this man would go after his own guys every once in a while. The Viper Randy Orton was the most cold and frightening character of this time period because of how unpredictable he was. In order made it work, he had the talent to make this character a success. And mm -hmm. one thing to know is they had such great acting skills at this point. He just knew how to do the things he was doing and when to do him. It was crazy. It's kind of funny how Mr. McMahon was Loki the most talented heel in the entire WWF. The reason why this I makes sense. is because he was hidden in plain sight. McMahon added a lot to the shows with his character and throughout the 2000s he showed why. At one point this man was cheered on Raw and hated on SmackDown like he was the Antichrist. Yeah. He was constantly provoking Hulk Hogan and fired him all because of his personal animosity towards him. Started having problems with his daughter Stephanie over the show. Wanted yeah. to see Zach Gowan fill and use his prosthetic leg and made a mockery uh, out of it. Used Brock Lesnar and a to attack his daughter and to top it all off he had a match with her and no mercy knew that his soul was destined for hell and started telling tales of his demise ahead of his buried alive match with the undertaker that didn't happen though when mcmahon disappeared he wasn't really involved with storylines until the end of 2005 when he targeted Shawn michaels mm -hmm. all for telling him to move on from montreal and this man was pressing him like why don't you go back to the old days the days of drugs and sex i'm yeah changed. this is this is this they turned hbk's you know Shawn michaels real life you know, demons he was dealing with both, you know, after, you know, well, before he left um, WWE the first time, because he was going through a lot of stuff physically, emotionally. He was dealing with, he was doing the drugs. He was on a, all types of stuff. And obviously, you know, Vince knew this, but the dude was doing some of the best work 
for WWE at that time before he retired the first time or whatnot. So when he came back, you know, HBK was clean. You know, he was you know, trying to get right with God or whatnot and focus on his career, you know what I'm saying, and, and trying to move forward from his past. But they turned that real-life situation into an angle where Vince was like, nah, I want you to be the old you. Let's bring out the drugs. Let's bring out the liquor. God, what is that? <laughs> Vince is just the worst, the worst boss possible. <laughs> oh, well, you'll enter the Royal Rumble, but only if you beat insert name. Tried to force him to retire, drugged his drink and made him take a drug test, which flipped on its head. Went to church and tried to find his own religion. Made a match with God as Shawn Michaels' his tag team partner. Won that match and started annoying Triple H who didn't want anything to do with him. And this led to the return of DX, mm -hmm. which drove McMahon crazy. Three months of hell. Sure, he had the upper <laughs> hand at some points, but by the end of it, he realized it wasn't worth dealing with DX. After his embarrassment at WrestleMania 23, this led to a change of appearance from McMahon. Oh, he sported the do rag and started annoying Bobby Lashley, and it was more comedy rather than some big oh, like... heel type of storyline. It slowly led to the end of the Mr. McMahon character. Not to mention, it wasn't as insane as he used to be. CM Punk signing with WWE caught some people off guard. Mm -hmm. In indie talent being scooped up by the biggest company around, and it's not like they didn't do this, it's just Punk's circumstances were significantly different than others like Paul London and Brian Kendrick. Punk's initial days in the WWE were as a face. It wasn't until 2009 that he took the role of a heel. Yeah. Punk was the direct opposite of what Jeff Hardy was all about, and it wasn't even hard for him to get booed. It's Jeff Hardy in the year of 2009. 2009 Jeff Hardy is like 2009 Lil Wayne. This guy was number one, but despite yeah. this, the Second City Saint went off the deep end with this new heel character and was so desperate to not only be hated, but to be considered the devil of WWE. Because of how much love Jeff Hardy had at the time and his own touch, it stood out. He was snarky, held himself to a higher esteem than the fans, and the difference mm -hmm. to Punk with other heels was that he wouldn't be like, you guys are nothing. He would go on about personal life choices such as being sober, and these rants got him even more heat. Best yeah. of all, he got rid of Jeff Hardy and dropped him with a belt after his goodbye speech. This man was absolute Bro, heat. He even disguised so himself good. as Hardy the following week, <laughs> devastating some of the fans. Punk's status on the card fell a bit, but it allowed him to create what was known as the Straight Edge Society. Members had to completely devote themselves to Punk and abstain from drugs and alcohol. Punk had some heat, but the whole thing never developed to a story that would rival his feud with Jeff Hardy. I always yeah. thought there was a potential world title story there, but it is what it is. Luke Gallo, Serena shaved their heads, and Punk was all enjoying himself, growing this big beard. He felt like he was almost a messiah-like figure. Mm -hmm. The Straight Edge Society helped CM Punk become one of the most hated men on SmackDown, but once he caught momentum with it, it was quickly taken out and disbanded. Punk didn't really have a long heel run in the 2000s, but in the small time he was given, he made the most out of it. So that's why I decided to include him here, because this man, for literally three months, pissed off every Jeff Hardy fan on Earth. Yeah. Made hate. <laughs> Chris Jericho's heel character in WWE had Facts. never been fleshed out properly. Early on, he was one of those mid-card heels, but because he was pretty popular, they turned him into a face. King of My World Jericho was a regular heel. He didn't do something that was too heinous, you know, basic heel stuff. He was leaning towards comedy at times. 2005 had some moments where he was brutal with John Cena, but his real standout was 2008. Jericho transformed himself into a very composed... This was good. This heel run, around this time, y'all know me, man. Y'all know this is one of my favorite heel runs from Jericho. And calm heel. He stood out easily because, for one, he shed any mention of his Y2J persona and reestablished himself despite not needing to. He needed to, though, because it was the only way he touched the main event scene. Chris Jericho was the deepest heel out there, and WWE yeah. knew this. He wasn't the most violent or cruel, but he stood out because technically everything he was saying was true. It's just he was the wrong messenger. Jericho yeah. compared to the rest here looks pretty clean. I added him here because he was the most unique and had a big interest in remaining in character outside of the arena. You ask most people, the best character of WWE in 2008 or the best heel, they're going to say Chris Jericho. Chris Jericho. He just yeah. did some amazing work that year. In 09, he was great as well, 2010 and onwards. And he was right most of the time, but just because he was a heel, that made him wrong. Now, these guys mm -hmm. weren't mentioned outright, but their actions certainly stood out. Heidenreich tried to destroy The Undertaker <laughs> crashing the car into him. That whole Michael Cole incident, which was crazy. Yeah. Sean O'Hare was very different to others because instead of doing these actions, he led others to that direction. Big Show swung a stretcher, bound Rey Mysterio. Jesus stabbed John Cena on a club and stole his yeah. chain. And there's plenty of examples out there. I didn't want to talk about comedy heels here as well because I just didn't think it was their place. King Booker, he was very entertaining, but he didn't fit the video much. Mm -hmm. Shawn Michaels' return in 2002 as a proud babyface made things seem unlikely for a potential heel turn. He came in as a heel with the NWO, but it was nothing compared to his old days. 2005, though, opened things up. 
Michaels took up the role of a villain for his feud with Hulk Hogan and yeah. man, oh man, this man was still as amazing as he once was. One month, he was a heel for only one month, yet yeah. people are still talking about it. Because HBK was making jokes about Hulk Hogan, mocking him, and even trolled the Montreal crowd into thinking mm -hmm. Bret Hart was coming back. This guy had no chill, and it's crazy, one month, but he made the most out of it. It's kind yeah. of unfortunate that HBK never continued being a heel from here on, because he clearly showed that he still had the ability for it. But regardless, at the end of the day, this was a very memorable run. It certainly stands out, especially for a short run. All right, these are the heels of the 2000s. A lot of these guys were absolutely insane. The way they booked them was crazy. This was all just to prevent some cheering. They wanted these guys to be booed 99% of the time. Yeah. The best heel out of all these guys, I'd say, is Triple H. I think Triple H was the best booked as a character, not the stories or whatever. I'm talking about his character, his heel persona. The way he was booked was almost a TV show character. He had the most background as well. You know, mm -hmm. He was a part of the clique, DX and whatnot, and he, he managed to make something out of himself. But other than that, all these guys did their job well. They were amazing. See, some of these guys would be doing some stuff you would not see today at all. You would For not sure. see stuff at all. All right, what you guys think of the heels of the 2000s? Please comment down below. That's this was a great one. Going to go ahead and like this video, as y'all should too. I'm going to link down the original video down below, man. But yeah, this was great. This was fantastic. Brought me down memory lane. I want to know who was y'all favorite heel during the 2000s era. Like, I wouldn't say favorite as in you was probably a fan of them back then. But when you look back on it now, you can appreciate the type of heel work they were doing. Man, not going to lie to you. From this video alone, it had to be... It's... It's... Triple H for sure, cause boy, he was just you just want you just wanted to make sure he never came back to Monday Night Raw, cause he was doing some dastardly things. Triple H for sure. If I had to choose someone else, a close second would be Randy Orton. His transformation into the bald Randy Orton was menacing, very menacing for sure. So, but y'all let me know y'all favorite heel from the 2000s eras in WWE. But I appreciate all love and support. You guys are showing on channel Road to 150K. And I'm still Young Speedy, YouTube Wrestling Champion World. Appreciate y'all kicking with me. See y'all next one. Peace.